One capital, two rival powers, and a battleground for half a dozen foreign states. Key powers jockeyed for position amid calls for ceasefires and threats of intervention. But why is Washington staying out of it, and what is Moscow's ultimate endgame? I'm Ali Aslan, and today's newsmaker is the war in Libya. Since the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi nearly a decade ago, Libya has been mired in conflict. But the geopolitical power play in Africa's most oil-rich nation feels like it's reaching a tipping point. A host of foreign players are lining up behind two competing administrations on the ground. In the West is the government backed by the UN and NATO, and in the East is a warlord with American citizenship, Khalifa Haftar. Russia, Egypt, Turkey, the UAE and France are all involved. But there is one superpower that's largely remained hands-off and silent, despite its usually outspoken president. Haider Abbasi has more on the Quiet Americans. There's been nearly 10 years of chaos in Libya. Almost constant fighting between rival militias since the removal of former leader Muammar Gaddafi has ruined the North African nation. If that wasn't enough, Libya is at risk of turning into a proxy war. Several countries are supporting opposing sides in the conflict. The notable exception is the United States. Four years ago, Donald Trump was elected on the promise to put America first. That included ending its wars abroad. Trump has also been accused of neither understanding nor showing interest in the region. His predecessor led a NATO air campaign in 2011 that helped to remove Gaddafi. But Barack Obama later admitted that not preparing for the aftermath of the war was the worst mistake of his presidency. The various tribes and armed groups that united against Gaddafi quickly turned on each other in a power vacuum. Trump may also be reluctant to intervene in Libya because of what happened in the city of Benghazi. In 2012, a militant group known as Ansar al-Sharia bombed a US consulate there, killing the ambassador. But America's lack of involvement may not be a lack of interest. Washington has learned from its ambassador in Libya that Russian weapons are being sent into Libya and that Moscow allegedly intends to build a military base there. Might that be enough to draw them in? And if so, could America's military might bring an end to the conflict? Or is there a risk the US will be dragged into another seemingly endless war? Haida Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Joining me now to discuss this from Washington, D.C., is Jonathan Weiner. He was the U.S. Special Envoy for Libya during the Obama administration, as well as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Law Enforcement. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, you have a great deal of expertise uh, when it uh, comes uh, to Libya, a country you know quite well. Many countries, as we said, at the forefront of the show are involved, but the United States is missing in action. How do you explain this? Donald Trump sees no political advantage to being involved in Libya. He was able to, in part, damage Hillary Clinton by associating her with the murder of four Americans in Benghazi by terrorists. And he doesn't want the word Benghazi or the word Libya to particularly ever apply to him. He would have been happy to celebrate a dictator's victory if Haftar had come in and been able to take Tripoli quickly, as represented uh, by Haftar, by the Egyptians, and by the Emiratis uh, last um, April. But with Haftar no longer being in a position to win, um, Trump, who never had a policy anyway, other than uh, trying to uh, respond to um, initiatives by uh, other uh, leaders, um, has no interest in it. He's in political trouble in the United States. Our elections are in November. 
and he is not going to want Libya to be part of the political conversation. As you said, of course, very crucial elections are coming up in November. Donald Trump is up for re-election against uh, Joe Biden, and certainly an issue like Libya would not play too well, I suppose, with a domestic audience. And it is consistent, though, with his America First policy, isn't it? Well, he's withdrawn um, from the United States from much of the Middle East and much of the world. He's broken up alliances. Uh, he's, he's essentially reduced the projection of American power on a global basis. Uh, this is dangerous for the United States. It's dangerous for American allies. It's not good for the world. We were helping stabilize things. That was uh, the core of the work that I was doing. And we were discouraging, it by every means we possibly could, uh, the possibility of uh, either intra um, 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 internal conflict, civil war in Libya, or a proxy war involving foreign actors. And my work was to constantly go to places like Turkey and the Emirates and Egypt uh, and to say, do not fight over this. Find ways of getting your interests aligned because Libya needs to be one country. It needs to be one country that is pr uh, providing stability and security for itself and therefore for the region. And it's got enough money to be able to take care of all of its people. So let's find solutions here. That was our policy. That's what we were doing. That's what we should be doing again. That's what the State Department and Defense Department wants us to do. And that's what we need to do to counter the risk of terrorism. And that's what we do to need to counter the risk of humanitarian crisis. Both are present as a result in part of the United States not being as fully present as we could be uh, during the Trump years. It's quite clear that you think that uh, American inaction in Libya is a mistake here. Now, of course, elections are coming up. Do you think that uh, U.S. President Joe Biden would have a different approach on this issue? I'm confident that U.S. President Joe Biden would have a uh, different approach to this issue. He's got good, knowledgeable people around him, and the United States government, uh, career people in the Defense Department and the, and the State Department, career diplomats, uh, career security experts, all see the Libyan civil war as a disaster for Libya, terrible for the Libyan people, bad for the region. And the, the region here includes the Sahel, the Maghreb, um, and the Mediterranean, uh, all mean in North Africa. It is uh, really catastrophic. The only people who are benefiting from it, as I see it, uh, are, are the Russians. Everybody else is being hurt. And the ambitions of one would-be dictator should not be sufficient to destroy a country. And that's what's been happening. What do you think would happen in and to Libya if Donald Trump were to gain a second uh, term? Uh, I believe that Donald Trump does not have foreign policies. He has transactions with foreign leaders. He would uh, continue to talk to Mr. Erdogan. He would continue to talk to Mr. Putin. He would talk to Mohammed bin Zayed. Uh, he would talk to Mohammed bin Salman, and he would talk to President el-Sisi. And out of those kinds of discussions, um, he might intermittently um, support uh, whatever it was they were coming up with. But it would be based on whoever was the last person to talk to him. And what he saw was the deal of the day. He, his approach has been quite separate, really, from that of the um, uh, career people in the U.S. government who have a, a rather fixed view, which is that civil war and conflict are not good for Libya. That Libya has the ability to be both pluralistic um, and stable, to integrate uh, Libyan people from, uh, throughout the country, to form a government, and to share the resources, east, west, and south, in ways that will stabilize the country and enable it better to combat the risk of uh, humanitarian threats, move ahead economically, and also counter um, terrorist groups, which do exist in Libya and are a threat to everybody. Just briefly, before I, we let you go, how optimistic are you that Libya will take a turn for the positive uh, in the long run? Are you optimistic at all? If Libyans are allowed to solve Libya's problems without foreign intervention, without foreign weapons and foreign military support, uh, they can do it. They need to be guided along to it through a unified, aligned group of, of, of foreign countries, all telling them the same thing, which is work things out, compromise, deal, um, find ways of talking with one another, find confidence building measures, find ways uh, to build trust in one another, create a military council that represents military people from throughout the country uh, to begin to create a national security institution to replace militias. Find revenue sharing approaches so that every Libyans have money in their pocket and municipalities get a share of the national oil wealth in order to provide services to people. 
this would give people a stake in a national Libyan government. Uh, you do, do that in an inclusive way, you can then deal with extremists all the way around, uh, reduce the threat from them, um, and uh, move ahead as a country. A stable Libya provides help to Egypt, it provides help to Tunisia, provides jobs for both of those countries, can provide contracts for foreign countries, whether you're talking China, Russia, Turkey, um, it's none of uh, my business, it's the business of Libyans and those and those countries to work out deals, but it needs to be constructive for everybody, not destructive like the current war. And clearly the upcoming elections in the United States in November will be key amongst other two the Libyan affairs as well. Thank you so much, Jonathan Weiner, for joining us. Let's turn now to a key player in the conflict, Russia. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has called for an urgent ceasefire, while at the same time the U.S. is accusing Moscow of providing military support to Haftar's forces, an accusation the Kremlin denies. So, is Russia sending mixed messages? Haider Abbasi has more on what Russia's trying to achieve. Since the removal of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011, two main competing powers have emerged in Libya. In Tripoli is the internationally recognized and UN-backed Government of National Accord, or GNA, led by Prime Minister Fayyaz al-Siraj. And in the eastern city of Tobruk is the House of Representatives. It's controlled by the warlord Khalifa Haftar, who leads the LNA militia. There are powerful nations that are backing opposing sides in the war. Let's take a look at Russia. Moscow supports Haftar and has supplied him with fighter jets and mercenaries. But Haftar's attempt to capture Tripoli failed and he's lost territory to the GNA. The Kremlin is now pushing for an end to the fighting. I don't see any other немедленного прекращения огня и э, решения всех остальных вопросов на основе э, переговорного процесса в русле тех пониманий, которые закреплены в декларации Берлинской конференции. But is Moscow playing a double game in Libya? On one hand, it's urging diplomacy, but at the same time, it's sending planes and fighters to Haftar. According to Oxford researcher Samuel Romani, arms and mercenaries are being used to strengthen Haftar's bargaining power in future negotiations. And what are Russia's interests in Libya? US military officials believe the Kremlin is eyeing lucrative energy deals in eastern Libya. They also say Russia wants to expand its political and military reach in the Mediterranean. But with Haftar humiliated, how far is Russia willing to go to secure those interests? Joining me now from London is Anas Elgomati. He's the director of the Sadek Institute, an independent think tank specializing in Libyan affairs. Also with us is Samuel Ramani, a researcher at Oxford University specializing in Russian and Middle Eastern foreign policy. And in London is Marco Carnelos, a former Italian diplomat and Middle East envoy who served as an advisor on Libya to former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us, Anas. The all-encompassing the all question here in the second part of the show, what is Russia's main goal in Libya? Well, it's, quite, it's a very complicated question because Russia is unlike any other actor in Libya. Its only um, rival, really, is the U.S. as a superpower. So when other countries play checkers, it's really that Russia is playing chess, that it has grand strategic objectives that go beyond this kind of winner-takes-all mentality that we find in smaller countries like Egypt or the UAE, who have clear ideological objectives, a winner-takes-all mentality, they want to install Khalifa Haftar. Russia shares those objectives at times, but it also benefits from a different kind of war, a never-ending war, a protracted war, where, in fact, the divisions in Libya, the divisions particularly amongst key NATO countries and allies, or allies in theory like Turkey and France, who should be, in theory, NATO allies, but find themselves on different sides of this conflict in Libya, Turkey supporting the government of national accord, and France now supporting Khalifa Haftar, a protracted conflict in Libya that brings these two allies closer together, sorry, that brings those two closer towards a conflict in a new theater, is one where Russia benefits through the demise of NATO. NATO, as a, as a strategic alliance, is infinitely more important 
than just the ideological or the economic or the political gains that Russia or other allies could make. Now, I agree with everything that was said in the previous segment. Those things still remain true. But Russia is playing a much bigger game in the Mediterranean that goes beyond just these classical objectives. Samuel, Anas is saying uh, Russia's concerns go way beyond uh, Haftar and his uh, forces. As a matter of fact, go way beyond Libya in this particular matter. Would you concur? Yes, I think I broadly agree with that. I think that Russia is not really personally wedded towards Philippe Haftar. After all, from my discussions with Russian diplomats and Russian defense officials, they view his CIA past, his U.S. citizenship, his ineffectiveness as a military commander in Chad and now in the current war as major liabilities. They're institutionally, I think, aligning with the LNA and the HOR with the Guila Sale in order to carve out his sphere of influence in eastern Libya and, and use that sphere of influence as a beachhead to increase their power in the Mediterranean. So they want perhaps a naval base in Benghazi. They want greater interoperability between their forces in the western Mediterranean and Syria and the eastern Mediterranean through Libya. They want nationwide reconstruction contracts that can parallel the Belt and Road from Benghazi to Sirte, which could really project power towards Italy, towards France, towards other European countries that at home has a Mediterranean power. And I think that they would, as Anna said also, benefit from a situation where this continued conflict that ultimately leads to a partition, where they, perhaps as an assistant to a Berlin peace talk, like as what they do doing with Assad and Syria, play a role in bringing Russia and Turkey together. And also, finally, it's a, uh, a point of leverage for them against Turkey and Syria. So if uh, Turkey escalates in Syria in ways they don't like, they can perhaps retaliate with jets like MIG-25s or PMCs in Libya to push back. So there's many factors at play here that tie towards their interest in Syria, Turkey, and their broader Mediterranean strategy that come from Libya. Quite manifold the reason here to, to weaken NATO, secure reconstruction contracts in energy and infrastructure, and build a military base in Libya. All reasons we've heard up until now for Russian involvement in Libya. Marco, what is your what is your take of Russian involvement? Well, first of all, we have to consider one point, a very important. Uh, Russia is usually a very skillful player. What I mean for that is someone that is able to carry out a very uh, good game, having very poor cards in his hand. Russia is not an economic superpower, but it's definitely a political, uh, diplomatic, and a military superpower. And they are engaged in uh, challenging the United States in multiple theaters, in the Middle East especially. And definitely, Libya is a place where Russia can have some leverage if a general understanding with the United States should take place. What I mean for that? I mean that definitely the first theater for uh, Russia is Syria. But Russia is engaged elsewhere. And so if the situation in Libya uh, evolves in a positive way, they will get a base. If it's not going to evolve, and oil contracts, for example, if it's not going in the right way, definitely Russia will still have a leverage to use in Libya to get something somewhere else. And this is a very skillful game that Vladimir Putin in particular is very, very clever in doing. And that definitely this is the Russia strategy, in my modest opinion. Anas, if we look at the situation on the ground, Haftar and the LNA uh, forces are certainly in retreat. How do you think this is going to play out also, and particularly from a Russian perspective? Well, it's interesting because, as we noted earlier on, this is not Russia's, or rather this is not Haftar's first attempt to take Tripoli. It's actually his third attempt in six years. And, and what has been shown in this latest attempt is that no matter what you give uh, Haftar in terms of material or financial or military support, he seems to fail. Now he's been given foreign troops, he's been given foreign aircraft, he's been given foreign weapons. And despite all of those things, he's still failed. Now that might mean that Haftar goes into oblivion and that he disappears, but the project still remains. And a clear component of this project is they need legitimacy in order to continue there and, and, and assert their presence there. That's been given by the head of the parliament in eastern Libya, Aguil Salah. But in the ground today, in this fine line in the sand of the, uh, of the city of Sirte, this is perhaps the most geo or the most important geostrategic location in the world at this moment. You have so many different powers and so many different winds all blowing in one direction or in, in these two different directions. It's difficult to identify whether or not Russia will just give up on Haftar, give up on Sirte, continue to negotiate after Sirte. But the reality is that I think that they don't really need Haftar. Haftar hasn't been able to give them what they need. So on the ground, 
I think they're going to start working with new actors. They'll find new relevant uh, interlocutors. They've already gotten the political legitimacy to continue their efforts in Libya. I think going forward, it seems like there's still a bit more left in this current round of the conflict before anyone determines which are the red lines in the sand. And particularly given the, the, the earlier comments from, um, from Jonathan Weiner, the lack of a clear and credible and, and, and an important American position in the region is giving so much more of a kind of winner-takes-all mentality for all of those different actors that are now uh, uh, fighting over, over literally kilometers in Sift. Samuel, how, how do you think this is uh, going to end from a Russian perspective? Obviously, they're not in the same position in Libya as they are in Syria, where they did stick it out with Bashar al-Assad until the very end. It's still very much in support of him. The, the dedication to Haftar seems to be a different one here, if you compare these two conflicts, no? Absolutely, yeah. I think that the U.S. Defense Department seems to view, in some cases, particularly Africa, uh, the uh, hybrid war in Libya to be equivalent to Ukraine and Syria. And that kind of, I think, misinterprets the extent to which Russia is committed. I think Russia engaged with Haftar opportunistically in order to gain leverage in eastern Libya and then eventually in southern Libya to take over some of their oil fields and gain investments as they already had Rostam preferential contracts in the GNA area. And also, eastern Libya was under UN sanctions. The uh, bank in Tobruk was uh, isolated too, which allowed for, for the Russians to supply banknotes. So they had an easy and ready access point. Now that Haftar is losing, I think that absolutely Russia is going to divest. Russia is already starting to get closer to Aguila Saleh, and is hoping that it can drive a rift between Saleh and Haftar. Interestingly, just 48 hours after Haftar declared self-rule and a mandate to govern, the Russians condemned that statement, and Lavrov uh, met with Saleh and said that Saleh was uh, proponent of peace in Libya. And they've engaged with them repeatedly uh, over the past month. So he's one figure that they could be working on. I think that Russia will not necessarily give up CERN, however, because of its strategic location, and also because it would be seen as less of a crisis proof partner to Egypt and the UAE. It will keep its PMCs there. It might fly more jets over there, maybe even deploy some Chechen forces in addition to the Syrian forces that they have. But they'll use military force as a way to buy time and find new allies. I think that they've lost confidence in Haftar's ability to carry it through and win the war. Marco, if we look at the situation from within Russia, obviously this is a country that, like any other nation these days, is battling a pandemic, economic, the, the fallout of an economic uh, downturn. It's been heavily involved in Syria for many years. And now in Libya, is there some domestic backlash to Russia exerting itself into all these international conflicts at a time when it's in itself is struggling? If there's a domestic backlash has not been evident so far for what we know, uh, we have to consider one point. The Libya, uh, Russia involvement in Libya so far has not been so costly, definitely less costly than the Syrian one. As I said before, it's a good card to play and could be quite useful to play and use its leverage in a future negotiation, wherever this negotiation could take place. What I mean, that definitely after is not Assad. So at the end of the day, if Russia will be compelled to square its resources and to rationalize its engagement, definitely Syria will be a much, much more important uh, asset in the, the Russian strategy. And this is what uh, we should consider. Uh, they will try. Uh, they will keep going, also because they are watching that the United States in this moment are much more involved in uh, uh, rebuilding its nation at home than, tr tr than try to uh, introduce peace and rebuild nation in the Middle East. This is the situation. From, from the vantage point of Moscow, the situation is good. We will see in the next uh, weeks, and definitely we have to wait until November to see which will be the definite uh, Russian policy, considering what will take place in the United States. Anas, we have uh, only a couple of minutes left to go, so uh, pleading for short answers from all three of you before we wrap this up. Do you think, do you think when it comes to Libya, uh, Russia is in it for the long run, or will it just cut its losses if it thinks it's no longer worth the effort? Well, the clearest question actually here is not actually whether or not Russia is invested. It's also that they have a clear ideological ally now, the United Arab Emirates, that is paying for most of the uh, Russian role in Libya. They've jointly operated the transfer of Syrians into eastern Libya and their training. They've also bought Russian air defense systems, the Pantsir S-1, 
to a tune of around 135 to 150 million dollars that were destroyed only in days. So it's really whether or not Russia's financial backer, the UAE and Libya, whether or not they whether or not they choose to divest or choose a different strategy entirely. So I think we all should keep this uh, open up and understand that there is a role here for diplomacy and there is a war within the diplomatic means and the ways in which they might try to achieve a, a solution or a result through diplomacy that we also can't rule out. And I think that's really where we have to understand that it's not just that these two sides are all playing a role, it's that those roles complement one another and that at the head of that pyramid, the UAE, who is now paying for Russia's role, guaranteeing Egypt a role there as well, if they choose to move, then it's very, very difficult to see how Russia will continue to pay for what has otherwise been a luxurious war for them. Well, unfortunately, we have to leave it at there. But uh, of course, uh, uh, Libya is a topic and a country we will continue to monitor and to look for in the coming weeks and months. Uh, Jonathan Weiner, Anas El Gomati, Samuel Ramani and Marco Carnelos, thank you so much for your insights into this geopolitical, all relevant affair. Thank you so much. And of course, thank you to you out there for watching and see you next time.